Oh, that's going to be so good. Listen, <clears throat> let's go ahead and uh, get started with this word because it's 159. And um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and have plenty of time to, to work through this. <laughs> oh, this is going to be good. This is going to be good. I pray. I pray. I put it like this. It was good to me. Um, and at the same time, it was, you know, like I said before, it's, this is unique. This is unique. And, and I'm, I'm going to enjoy this, this season, this journey that God has me in when it comes down to ministering, um, his word. I need to change my view. There we go for my document. Okay. Uh, so for those of us who, um, or who are listening, who may have missed the first message in this series, I really encourage you, when you get an opportunity to go back and listen to the message from last week, that was the first one of many, any of you who really follow us and fellowship with us, you kind of know who we are and and the, the perspective which we come from. And it's all gospel and it's all Christ-centered, all Christ-centered. Oh my goodness. It is Christ and him crucified. And our, what would you call, um, not the focal point, but the, for me anyway, what the Lord has shown me over the years to help me to, to guide me in my studies and in my pursuit of truth and my pursuit of wisdom and knowledge from his word is to continue to dig and to continue to ask, to continue to ask, seek and knock on the scripture until I find the, the cross, until I can see the cross and what Christ did at the cross clearly in that passage of scripture. And so until then, I know that uh, I've, I've, I'm not, I'm just dealing with the surface. I haven't gotten to the, the center, but even once I find the cross, that doesn't mean that I, that that's the end of it. That's, that's the door to now open up and to go into further and deeper truth. But when I hit the cross, it's like, Ooh, I, I, I found it. <laughs> okay. Now let me explore this that I found. So I'm just saying that to say, for any of you who um, may be just for the first time engaging with us, whether on Wisdom or Facebook, I want you to know that the message that I'm going to minister today, um, you know, it's I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through what I might do. It's like on a Thursday night and really give you scripture, scripture, scripture. And, you know, and it'd be just like preaching the gospel, gospel, gospel. I focus, I'm focusing on pulling out leadership principles from the gospel, because I do believe that all of us are called to lead people into the truth of, of Christ in some way, maybe not necessarily pulpit ministry, but there's something God has given each and every one of us that God wants us to do. There is fruit that we should be bearing in our life, fruit that is evident that not just that we are filled with the spirit and saved by the, you know, the spirit of God through Christ Jesus and, and kept and sanctified by him, but that the spirit we have allowed the spirit to now give us his agenda, not just for our life, but for the lives of others, where that we actually move outside of who we are and just keeping Christ for ourselves to help us through the day and help us on our jobs and stuff to where we actually are able to give him to others through our life, where we use our vocal cords, our lips to speak of his goodness, where we use our hands to serve in the community, where we, where we use our lives to glorify God and to release fruit. Um, so go to our website and go to actually go to our YouTube page and look for the many messages we got. We're moving close to 200 videos now 
not just me teaching, but any of our ministers that have ministered on a Sunday. Um, we've recorded those and we've uploaded those in our Thursday comprehensive teachings, breaking down the doctrine of Christ and others. They're out there. So if you want more than what you get today, go to our YouTube page at CEK Ministries and you will be able to find us. Um, we are, as I said, continuing our dive into studying truths and principles of the leadership anointing of God. In our previous series that we just came out of, uh, we focused on the requirements of the anointed and we learned much about the confidence of the presence of God by looking at Moses' journey to becoming the first official anointed leader of God. In this series, which we've titled Much Fruit, we are going to learn uh, the promises or many, I can't say all of them, but we are going to learn many of the promises God has given to those who have been anointed by his spirit and the good fruit and results from following the spirit's anointing. I need you to know that is what this focus is, okay? Because um, I know a lot of times people are concerned that they don't really hear you preaching a lot on Jesus or whatever. We do all the time. But I just want you to know this is what this is about. And it's important for us to know the promises that God has given to those who have been anointed by his spirit. This is important, not just for us as leaders, but for those who are just coming into the knowledge, the saving knowledge of Christ and are looking to be led and in fellowship and in relationship and in membership in the body of Christ with God's anointed leaders. You want to be able to identify what an anointed leader is supposed to look like, how they live, the, their, their, their idea, how God relates to them, how God blesses them, how the anointing of God expresses himself through them so that you won't be confused and conflicted trying to figure out what somebody is supposed to be or what somebody ain't supposed to be doing or preaching or whatever, but you can, you can learn. Okay. And it's very important. And it's important not just to know the promises that God gives to those who have been anointed by his spirit, but the good fruit that is to follow the spirit's anointing the results of the anointing on their life. And so the series we just came out of, that was very, very good for those who are uh, just coming up in the faith and you're looking to find a place to connect to because it spoke to the requirements of the anointing of God. We don't just get the anointing. We don't, the God doesn't anoint us and then there's no requirements to, to, to maintain, you know, the, the anointing. It's not that, if we can keep it within our own strength, but there's there's a life, a style of living and loving and, and faith that he expects us to walk in so that his anointing can be present and free, free to, to do all of what the anointing is sent to do in our life, not just for us, but for others through us. So um, the scripture for our Much Fruit series is uh, our scripture foundation is chapter is Psalms chapter 89 verses 19 through 29. Okay. I'm going to read that again. And, um, and I'll be reading from the new King James version and it reads, then you spoke in a vision to your holy one and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. This is the one that's highlighted because this is where we are. We've worked on part half of that verse last week, verse 19, and we're going to look at the second half of it this week. Okay. But let's go ahead and, and read. Um, you spoke in the vision to your holy one and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. 
goes on to say, I have found my servant David with my holy oil. I have anointed him with whom my hand shall be established. Also, my arm shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. I will beat down his foes before his face and plague those who hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. And in my name, his horn shall be exalted. Also, I will set his hand over the sea and his right hand over the rivers. He shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also, I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My mercy I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall stand firm with him. His seed also I will make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. Father, help me and anoint me fresh in this moment. In verse 19, we discovered a major result from the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We discovered that um, the first thing that we looked at last week was a result of having the anointing of the Holy Spirit is we receive God's help. God's help helps or helpers, but they are God's. That's what he gives us, helpers. He gives us help, okay? So so, so, the first major result that we see is this, this uh, from the anointing of, of the Holy Spirit is, is God's help being given. Shava is the Greek or uh, the Hebrew word. His help being Shava, which means composed, equalized, or leveled, to those who are his mighty ones. This word mighty is Gabor. You've heard Jehovah, Gabor, aha. Uh -huh. So we receive, uh, he gives help to his, his mighty ones. And, 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 and so this word mighty means strong, warrior, champion, great, outstanding ones. We talked about how it doesn't mean that that uh, this is something that uh, this is something that's in the fabric of the person. This is part of their character. This is part of their DNA. Okay, and as they are uh, um, becoming becoming who God has ordained them to become, they're showing the the traits of one who is strong, the the traits of one who is a warrior, the the traits of one who is a champion. Okay, and he gives his help to that one who does not shrink back, but to that one that that runs toward that 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 injustice to do something about it. That one that runs toward the helpless, to, moved by compassion to help to provide their need. Those who that show up, he gives help to. He anoints them in a mighty way so that they can do greater than what they were able to do within their own instinct to do. Help uh, specifically means assistance and support in times of hardships and distress. So this help isn't coming just to help you. Uh, let me figure out what I'm going to make for dinner today. And then going to help you to, 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 to figure out if you're going to have chicken or, or shrimp. No, no, no. This, this help we're talking about is assistance and support in times of hardships and distress. And he promises, okay, this is one of the results of the anointing of God's spirit. It's help for those kind of times. I talked about how God saw David and us in ways others would, would never consider us, not even our own families. But God sees his mighty ones. He sees and deems what he would consider a mighty one. And he sees us and pours out fresh wine into and oil 
upon his mighty ones in response to what? To his purposes for us and our hearts for him. So it's a two-way thing. If David did not have a heart for God the way that he did, he wasn't perfect, but he had a heart for God, then he would not have received the kind of wine and oil from God that he did. He wouldn't have been raised up and exalted the way he was. But because of God's purpose for him and his heart for God, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, he got poured out fresh wine into an oil upon this mighty one. And so we learned from this story uh, many things that we pulled out. Mm -hmm. We learned even how God, he helps us when others lack vision or when other, or put it like this, he helps us when others lack a vision, lack of maturity, lack of revelation causes them to come against the progressive revelation and moves of God being given and worked through his mighty ones. Mm, I, I, listen, I was listening to um, Eris's message this morning and we're just kind of very much right in line with one another talking about, you know, um, how God does things and how he selects and moves in the lives of the least likely. Okay. And so what God, God does, he helps us when others work against us or when others deny us or disprove of us, when others lack of vision, maturity, or revelation causes them to come against the progressive revelation and moves of God. Okay. Um, being given to his mighty ones and being worked through his mighty ones. Our role and responsibility is not to spend a lot of energy and focus trying to teach or drag people into our revelational reality or apologize for it. But we are responsible as God's anointed leaders to respond to their inability to, to, to live and believe as we do, okay, um, we, are, we are called to respond to them the way Jesus responded, say, for instance, to Thomas. He wasn't angry with Thomas. He simply gave himself to Thomas in the capacity of Thomas's faith. God isn't calling us to, to, to rebuke people uh, or whatever because they don't see us, they don't receive us, they don't believe that God's called us to whatever he is. God doesn't call us to, to, to do any of those things. He's called us as anointing. See, there's a see, see, people think anointing means something or that we are supposed to behave or respond in certain ways because we're anointed. You know, that we're supposed to, you know, well, touch not thine anointed, do thy problem. We understand that that scripture is there for a reason, but it's there, it's it's not there to be like this this thing that we can walk around and be boastful in and arrogant and try to, you know, make people see who we are and we're oh so great. No, the anointing settles us. The anointing makes us humble. The anointing makes us meek. The anointing gives us patience, long suffering, uh, causes us to be gentle with people and not harsh and, and hateful and whatever. <laughs> That's not the anointing. It's not how the anointing responds. We see with Christ, he wasn't angry. He simply gave himself to Thomas in the capacity of Thomas's faith. So if you missed that initial groundbreaking foundation laying message for our series of uh, much fruit um you want to go back and listen to that and that message is titled unapologetically anointed and you can view it on our youtube page at cek ministries 
So today we are focusing on verse 29, but we're also going to be looking at verse 24, 27, and 29. Okay? Uh, these verses read, I'm going to read them to you. Let's start with 19, which we already have. Then you spoke in a vision to your holy one. Okay, we talked about last week that this was Nathan that he's talking about here. Because holy and one is not capitalized. He's talking about the prophet Nathan. Then you spoke in a vision to your holy one and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. So this is God talking to Nathan about David. And that he has given help to David, who he calls mighty. And that he has exalted David, the one chosen from the people. Then verse 24 says, but my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. And in my name, his horn shall be exalted. Now, before I read verses 27 and 29, we have to do a little um, little in-depth study here on this verse, okay? The second half of it says, in my name, his horn shall be exalted. I just love, uh, y'all got to listen to Eris' message this morning. Um about the the um god the father part four because she was talking about you know <laughs> she's talking she's talking about so many things but she was i really love how she was talking about the name that he gave her as the heiress okay and how you know we are his children and he's not the kind of father that you know doesn't pay child support or anything how we how we may have experienced things in this natural world that god always supports his children that it, and that child support is eternal you never outgrow being supported as his child okay um and and when you become when he adopts you just think about it even in the natural world when a father adopts a child that child receives his name so their name is changed and they now have his name as their name so, you know, we're not necessarily going to go down to vital statistics and have the name on our certificate changed to the last name of Jesus or, you know, Adonai or something like that. But we know in the spirit, he calls us by his name. He has given us his name. And so in this passage, it says, and in my name, his horn shall be exalted. So, so, so this message that we're going to talk about today, I want those who may be listening to understand that I'm, we're not boasting, we're not being arrogant or prideful or, or, or any of the kind of carnal kind of ways that a person may think about um, being exalted in God. But this is the this is the word of God. When God chooses and when he makes you his own, he puts his name on you. And when you please him and when you when you serve him in an elevated capacity, then he, he he's the one that elevates you. He's the one that exalts you. And so the scripture says, in my name, his horn shall be exalted. So in the natural world, the horn is an animal's strength and defense. An animal's strength and defense are his horns. So when we take this and parallel it in the spirit as it relates to a, one of God's leaders or a servant of the Lord, the horn represents a leader's anointing, power, strength, speech, fruitfulness, and ministry. Mm -hmm. Again, the horn represents a leader's anointing, a leader's power, strength, speech, fruitfulness, and ministry. So now that you see that, think about this, this verse again. My faithfulness and my mercy shall be with my mighty one, the one that I have exalted, I have chosen from uh, the people, okay? In my name, his anointing 
shall be exalted. His power shall be, he'll have a higher anointing. He'll have a higher power. In my name, his, his strength shall be exalted. His speech shall be exalted. His fruitfulness shall be exalted. His ministry shall be exalted. We're going to look at what this word exalted means in a moment, but let's go further with verse 24. We see a good example in the account of Hannah. Second Samuel chapter two, verses one through 10, read it in your own time. But we see a good example of this uh, exaltation of the horn in, in, in her, but there's so many others that we could also look at. I just wanted to give a, a woman an honorable mention this morning. Hannah had been barren for many years. And as a result, she felt this, she had this bitterness of soul because of this barrenness, because of the fact that she had not bore her husband any children. She saw her condition. Uh huh. Um, she saw in her condition, rather, imagine her looking at her condition. She saw in her condition that her horn or life. Because see this horn, see she, this, her her life is her horn. Our life is our horn. Okay, we can compare it to such. So she saw in her condition that her horn or her life had not been exalted by God. It had not been lifted up over the circumstances. It had not been lifted up. Uh, um, it you know it even to. But just the ex expected in, okay? But it was beneath the promises, beneath what a, what in those times would consider a woman to be uh, a useful, to be um, a, a blessing to her husband. She had not even elevated to that. So it, she saw in her condition that her horn had not been exalted by God. However, after she got pregnant and, you know, after God gave her Samuel as a son, she felt that her horn had been exalted as it related to her own life and to the ministry of her son. I love what Frank Damasio, the one who wrote The Making of a Leader, I love what he says about this. He says, God purposed to exalt Hannah's son over Eli because the sins of Eli's house had corrupted him before God. God chose the horn of Samuel to replace the horn of Eli. So when you read 2 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, and, and just the whole account all the way around, you will see this term horn, exalting, so on and so forth. So I just wanted to put that in there just to insert for, for verse 24, that when God says, but my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name his horn shall be exalted, how, and how this represents anointing power, strength, speech, fruitfulness, and ministry as it relates to the leader. But just in our lives as a believer, our horn could just be our overall life. The overall condition of our life, the overall sense of fulfillment and purpose in our life, the, our whole overall life and what is uh, purposed for us, the reason why we are here. Then let's look at verse 27. Uh, it says, also, I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Okay, so here I highlighted firstborn, the highest. Okay, so when we see this, we understand with David, David, <laughs> David was the highest of the kings of the earth. He was the, the first king um, that God had that was his king, 
the firstborn of, of his king, king that would represent his kingdom to come that was to be established. He's the firstborn and the highest of the kings of the earth. So here we see him being exalted. His horn is being exalted over the horn of Saul. Because Saul was the very first king, okay? And then we see verse 29, it says, his seed also I will make to endure forever and his throne as the days of heaven. Talking about David. So when you look at this word make, when I see his seed, I will also make to endure forever. To me, that points to him raising him up. Okay. I will raise up his seed. Also, I will raise up to endure forever. We know he's talking about Christ. And his throne represents a seat of honor and authority. Okay. And so he's like, and his seat of honor and authority, I will make as the days of heaven. So there's, there's no time limit in heaven. It's going to endure throughout all the heavens. Ah, my goodness. And so those are our four verses that we're going to focus on uh, or that we're going to use for today's message. You know, I mentioned uh, last week and I want to reiterate how when God revealed himself to you <laughs> and revealed yourself to you, that that was not only a moment of revelation, but a moment of exaltation. Mm -hmm. A moment that if you did not know it, then I'm sure you know it by now, but in that moment of exaltation, that moment brought you into a dimension of authority that you wouldn't have if you did not have that experience with him. I'm telling you, just like Evangelist Sean was sharing today, the dream she has, whenever we have pyros and supernatural moments with God, those are, those are times of divine um, fellowship and impartation from God, revelation, promotion, elevation, exaltation. There, there's uh, authority, wisdom. There's things that are being released to us because we had an encounter, a one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, so to speak, spirit to spirit encounter with our father, our heavenly father. And we never go into his presence and, and, and not come and come out without improvement, without transformation, without some kind of transference taking place. And so when he revealed himself to you and yourself to you, it wasn't just a moment of revelation. So now you got something extra to preach or, you know, just some new insight. I need you to understand it was also a moment of exaltation because God even if he came down to you, he still, it may seem like he heaven came down to you, but really God lifted you up into his sphere. He exalted you. He brought you up to a higher place and realm, another dimension into his dimension. And that also gives you uh, another dimension, another level another degree of authority that you just would not have had without this experience. When we say authority, it's not authority where you go and you boss others around or anything. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about, you know, uh, um, access, knowledge, understanding, wisdom in, in, with God and in God. A, another level of assurance and confidence in God, in his presence, in his ability, in his, his plan for you, that, that helps you to be able to better resist the devil when he would come in with his schemes and lies and try to convince you of something opposite of what you received from God. Because now you know that you know that you know 
and can't nobody take that from you. Okay. And so <clears throat> this often happens, these moments like this, when, when, when revelation comes, they often happen without our consent or anticipation. Say hello, somebody. Come on, evangelist uh, 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 Sean. Did, did, did you consent to that dream? Did you anticipate that dream? No, you did not. These moments happen without our consent or anticipation. But nonetheless, we must not forfeit what was done in us, done for us, and imparted to us in these moments. How can we forfeit them? Oh, by dismissing them. Oh, it was just another dream. Or, oh, that was just another encounter. Or to, uh, by de devaluing them, okay? Because of maybe um, lack of understanding, lack of maturity, uh, lack of faith, because of fear. A lot of times we devalue things because of fear, unbelief. Mm -hmm. And even we can you know, uh, uh, forfeit them by negligence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We must not forfeit these moments. Oh, we must not forfeit what God has released to us in these divine encounters. Exaltation and authority comes as a direct result of the anointing. It is a direct product of the anointing. It is fruit that we should bear as a result of being uh, receiving the anointing. When the anointing comes upon us, there's a product, there's fruit. God, the anointing is, is who he is. You know, he brings the product, but we bear the fruit. We don't produce the product. He is the product. But we bear the fruit mm -hmm. of the anointing. Mm. And the exaltation that we're going to talk about today and the authority that results from exaltation, I believe they're synonymous. Uh, it comes as a, a direct result of the anointing. You, you, you're not going to get it any other way. Not, not exaltation. With, with God, it, it comes as a result of the anointing. And as the anointed of God, <clears throat> you should expect this. You should expect, not reject exaltation, but expect it. Don't reject it because of pride. Uh huh. Selfishness, false humility, low God confidence, or any other lie or spirit that would make you shrink from or turn away from God's work of exaltation and release of authority in your life. You are called to be unapologetically exalted. Mm -hmm. You don't have to apologize for how God lifts, how God has lifted you up out the muck and the mire <laughs> and has and has made you a new creation and has given you his spirit with no limits, no boundaries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No male, no female, no black, no, no white, no nothing. Just his spirit, his anointing. You are called to be unapologetically exalted. And I warn you, do not reject God's exaltation because of pride or false humility. They're, they're, they're synonymous. Or selfishness, like, oh, God wants to do this in my life. He wants to do this. He wants to send me there. He wants me to, oh, I don't want to do that because, oh, it's going to be inconvenient or it's going to, that selfishness, those, you know, that keeps you from 
from allowing God to exalt you and, and give you the authority because see, with exaltation and authority comes great responsibility and a lot of people don't want it. They don't want it. Yes, yes, yes. But you're called to be unapologetically exalted. Mm -hmm. So exalt, what do we mean when we say exalt? Let's look at this word. Um, the word exalt in these passages of scripture comes from the Hebrew word room. It's literally pronounced like a bedroom or, you know, bathroom room, but it is spelled R-U-M, okay? In our English phonetics, it's spelled R-U-M in our English language. And so this Hebrew word room, its root word means to be highly active, to rise or raise. All right, so now let's break down. To be No, no, no. Oh, I said that wrong. This is wrong. It is to be high actively. That's very different. To be high actively, to rise or raise. So when we say high, this word high, it's a noun. It means, an, it, as a noun, it's an elevated place or region. So when he's taking us high, okay, he, he, he wants to, to make us even an elevated place or region. As an adjective, it is rising or extending upward a great distance, elevated or rich in quality mm, or character. It is of relatively great importance, such as foremost in rank, dignity, or standing. It is at or to a high place, altitude, level, or degree. So you're called to be high, uh huh, to be of relative great importance, okay, as, a, as you know, foremost in rank, dignity, or standing, to be elevated as or rich in quality or character, mm -hmm. but not just to be high, but to be high. Actively, ah, come on. When we say actively, actively means in a deliberate and positive way, in an energetic or vigorous way. So God is saying that we are to unapologetically be rich in quality or character, to be of relatively great importance and foremost in rank, dignity, or standing, to ascend, to live, a, which means to abide at a high place, altitude, level, or degree in what? In a deliberate, positive, and vigorous way. Mm -mm. That's just to be high actively, but we also want to look at rise and raise because these are our definitions for exalt. So I went to English Club. Dot com. I just love them for definitions. This is what they gave us for these two words. Raise means to lift or move something to a higher level or to increase, depending on the context. Rise means to come or go upwards, to ascend to a higher level or to increase in the amount of or level of something. The verbs raise and rise both refer to something going up, okay? The main difference between them is that raise is transitive, meaning it must have a direct object and rise is intransitive, meaning that there is no direct object. Okay, so in other words, something raises something and then something rises. So, so, so raise, like I said, is transitive, meaning it has, to, it must have a direct object. So something raises something. But rise doesn't need a direct object. Something rises. So if you raise something, it means that you 
elevate it. You move it up or lift it to a higher level. So for example, in a sentence, we would say something like, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Or Mary raises her voice when she's hang angry. Hangry, okay. Or they have raised their prices every year, all right? But if something rises, it means that it elevates itself. It goes up itself. No external force is needed to lift it. But note that there is not always a physical movement. Sometimes the, the meaning uh, rise is just to increase. So for example, I like to rise at 6 a.m., but my husband stays in bed until 8 a.m. Hot air rises. Another one is Jane has risen in her company very quickly and is now CEO. Prices are rising all the time. So prices aren't physically, but they are increasing. So, so, so that rise means that there's not always a physical, tangible thing, a movement there. It could just simply mean to increase, but it all depends on the context. So to help illuminate and compare the nuances in this meaning, and, and I, I just got to take this time. This is what we do, right? Because I don't want you to have the wrong understanding, expectation of exaltation, okay? If God, he has exalted us. He's exalting his people, and, and you need to understand the nuances of it. So to help eliminate and compare the nuances in the meanings, here are some more examples with the word raise and rise in the same sentence. We, we raise the flag when the sun rises. <laughs> Whenever our commanding officer comes in, we rise from our chairs and raise our hands in salute. The helicopter rose into the air, raising the survivors out of the water. So the main differences between um, the verbs rise and raise is that somebody or something can rise on its own, whereas an outside force is needed to raise somebody or something. So of other scriptures that use this Hebrew word room, I just got, there was, there were so many, but I just, just, there's just like only, there's five I want to share, but but to me, this is so good. We see this word room in Genesis chapter seven, verse 17, where it says, the waters increased and lifted up the ark and it rose high above the earth. So the waters increased. And I looked, I said, was this increased also room? It's not, it's a different word. And it said, the waters increased and lifted up the ark, Ooh, and it rose high above the earth. Rose high is the same word that we see in our context scriptures, our foundational scriptures, is room. We also see room in Genesis chapter 14, verse 22, where it says, but Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth. So here we see him raising his hands to swear. He's, he's saying that I have, I have, you know, raised my hand. I have sworn my hand, my life, everything that I have to the Lord, God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth. So he exalted his own life. He lifted his own life up into the, into, to God, to, 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 to dedication to God, to the Lord, God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth. And then we see Genesis 41 and 44. Though I am Pharaoh, yeah, and I'm reading from the Amplified this time. All the rest of them are New King James. 
Though I am Pharaoh, yet without your permission shall no man raise his hand to do anything or set his foot to go anywhere in all of the land of Egypt. All classes of people shall submit to your authority. So this is Pharaoh talking to Joseph. God had exalted Joseph. He had raised him up and Joseph rose, you know, he rose himself in God's raising okay, to receive what God had did in his life. And Pharaoh is now affirming him by saying, now I, okay, am giving you charge over what I have charge of. And I say that no man will raise himself up. He will not raise his hand or his foot to go anywhere or do anything uh -huh, without understanding that every decision he has will come under your authority. Every decision, everything that he thinks he's gonna do is gonna have to submit to your approval. That's some pretty high exaltation, but that's the anointing of God that had exalted him to such a place that no one else could be exalted without his permission. And then we see Exodus 7 and 20 that says, and Moses and Aaron did so just as the Lord commanded. So he lifted up the rod and struck the waters that were in the river in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants and all of the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. So lifted up is the same room. He exalted the rod. He exalted the rod and struck the waters that were in the river. And then finally, um, let's look at Exodus 14 and 8. This is this, this, I love this one here. And the Lord hardened um, the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with boldness. Mm, mm, mm. Boldness is the word here. When you look at it in the Hebrew, it is room. It is the same, it's the same exact word. It's exalted. And so when you read this in the King James Version, it says the children of Israel went out with an high hand. In the uh, Holman Version, it says the children of Israel went out triumphantly. The Legacy Standard Bible says came out with an exalted hand. The Berean says, came out defiantly. So defiantly and exalted hand, triumphantly and high hand, they all mean room. But I want us to look at how the New King James puts it because other versions also use boldness or boldly, that the children of Israel went out with boldness. This kind of boldness, this kind of exalt exaltation gives us boldness. <laughs> exaltation makes us bold. If we aren't, if we don't understand that God has exalted us and given us authority, then we won't have the boldness that we need to do the work that God has called us to do. This kind of boldness comes from the anointing that not only exalts us and gives us authority to live and to lead, hallelujah, it, it, it does this uh, by putting us in a seat of exaltation. So I'm going to repeat this sentence again, because I think I may not have typed it right, but I'm going to try it again so it makes sense for those who are listening and trying to just hold on. This kind of boldness comes from the anointing that not only exalts us, uh huh, but gives us the authority to live and lead from this seat of exaltation. So we're not just like, you know, some people get these, these honorary titles or honorary whatever, and oh, just sit right there and just be pretty and, you know, just whatever, but you don't have no real power, no real authority. No, God doesn't exalt us just to sit there and be cute. He does this to give us authority to live from this seat of exaltation and to lead from the seat of exaltation. This truth is troublesome. 
Mm -hmm. It's troublesome to many people who do not perceive the grace of God aside from the lens of the flesh. The flesh that largely interprets and applies the words of Christ according to classes of people. Uh huh. Classes of people uh, categorized uh, uh, in the flesh rather than classes of people categorized in the spirit. Because in the spirit, there's only two classes of people uh huh. Believer and unbeliever. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Saved and unsaved. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so, the, so as far as the Lord is concerned, his anointing is for the believer. He's not worried about whether you're young or old, male, female, black, white, Jew, Gentile. Mm -mm. This anointing, this exaltation that gives us the authority to live and lead from the seat of exaltation, this truth is troublesome. It's troublesome to those who perceive the grace of God through the lens of the flesh. And like I said last Sunday, we cannot make people unsee our flesh and see us and accept us the way God sees us anoints us, appoints us, and exalts us. And we cannot take it and make it personal when they do not, because it's not about you and me. It's about the Lord. It's about the Lord. The Lord will supply himself through us to them, to the people according to their faith and their revelation capacity. Don't worry about those who don't receive you, who don't believe that, that God is with you or for you or can use you in the capacity that he has identified you to be used by him as a, as a missionary, as a psalmist, as a teacher, as a, an entrepreneur, you know, as a pastor, whatever. You know, it's, it's not your job to make them see you as exalted by God. We, we cannot take it and make it personal when they do not. Mm -hmm. Our job is to allow the Lord to supply himself through us to them according to their faith and revelation capacity. That, that's what Christ did when he, when he, went, when he went back home. He can only do but, you know, little miracles, but the Lord supplied himself to those according to their faith and their revelation capacity. He didn't beat them up. He didn't run them down. He didn't call them everything but a child of God. He didn't, he didn't touch not that on it. You don't see me for who I, he didn't go through none of those changes. He su supplied himself according to their faith and revelation capacity. People must do the spiritual work of remaining new wineskins. We, we can't make somebody be a new wineskin. We can't make them receive new revelation. We can't make them receive new wine. They must do the work themselves. It's a personal spiritual work that they must do to remain new wineskins, open and available for the next and new move of God. We must remain in, uh, uh, we must remain new wineskins to receive increased understanding of how God uses whom he chooses. I, I love, I, you know, Eris this morning has said something that I had said before a long time ago about how we must not come to the place to start worshiping you know, at the altar of our uniqueness, our uncommonness or whatever it is that we believe, because then, you know, if we become, try to become exclusive and elitist or whatever, like Pharisees, we become like the Pharisees and Sadducees and other groups that 
have done the same thing that persecute anyone else for not being, you know, wonderful or whatever, like, like we may perceive ourselves to be. No, our job is to become, is to remain as new wineskins, always open and available for the next and new move of God. We must remain new wineskins to receive increased understanding of who God is and, and, and who he is in our lives and, and how and who he uses from whom he chooses. Mm -hmm. It's his choice. It's his anointing. This is his kingdom. This is his gospel. He is God. It's about him. We cannot kidnap him and put him into our cultural uh, baskets and try to make him fit what we perceive and what we're willing to, to, to understand. 1 Corinthians 1 verses 23 to, through 27 states, not many mighty, not many noble, not many wise after the flesh, but the foolish, the weak, the base, the despised things. And the are nots hath the Lord chosen. Listen, y'all, I need y'all to sit with that for a minute. Think about that. God doesn't, not to say that he doesn't choose those who are born of, of high descent, that he doesn't choose those who have come that are the seed of a family that is, is faithful and loyal and obedient and worshipful. I'm not saying that he wouldn't choose those. They're, they're, they're born, I don't want to say born chosen, but it's part of their lineage. And the Lord, and that's what the Lord wants. When he, when he first put us here in this earth, he wanted us to be fruitful and to multiply holy seed. So that is his design. But guess what? We live in a fallen world where people are born of low descent and in some terrible circumstances and are considered the foolish and the weak and the base, the least likely. And those are the ones that he also chooses. Not many mighty, not many noble, not many wise after the flesh, because there ain't that many of us being born like that, right? But the foolish, the weak, the base, the despised things, and the are nots. They are the ones that the Lord has chosen. I like, I love how it reads in the Amplified. It says, God has selected for his purpose the insignificant, base things of the world and the things that are despised and treated with contempt, even the things that are nothing, so that he might reduce to nothing the things that are. So historically, historically, I'm not picking on nobody and I'm not saying, I'm just saying historically, statistically, okay, women are the weak, the despised, the are nots when it comes down to the kingdom of God, okay? Yet they are the ones that Jesus chose to consistently reveal his identity and purpose to first. And the ones who Jesus sent first with the divine announcement. The one that he, he sent Mary Magdalene first. She's considered what many call apostle to the apostles. He sent her first to go and tell the apostles that he had risen. So that they could then get up and go tell others he had risen and get all of the credit for being the ones that are told of, but not, you know, it's, it's I, I love how it can be overlooked how Jesus set things in order. He laid a foundation that we were to build on, a foundation of, of liberation, of liberation for, for the females, for the slaves, for the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So historically, women are the weak, the despised, the are nots, but yet they're the ones that Jesus chose consistently 
Mm. Blacks, and not just only Blacks, but many other races and nationalities. But I'm going to say, because here in America, we understand historically uh huh, that Blacks are the base. Because we're looking at some of the terms that were put in 1 Corinthians. Uh -huh, the insignificant, the base, the, the despised, the ones treated with contempt. The, that's what Blacks are. I don't want to say were, because we still deal with this to, to, this, to this day. Blacks are the base, the despised, the are nots. We are considered the are nots in this passage of scripture. Mm -hmm. Yet, in the Bible, huh, many Blacks are the key actors in this biblical account. And <laughs> it was a Black man who helped Jesus carry his cross. I can't imagine any other, there was no other thing that was done by a person more significant. Yes, a woman poured out oil, but she, that was a weak thing, poured out oil, uh, signifying uh, uh, the, the death, burial, resurrection. Many things were done, but the, the thing that was the hardest thing for Christ to do, and he needed help doing it, who was it that helped him do it? But one who is considered the despised, the ones who are treated with contempt, the least likely was the one who helped Jesus. Carry his cross. The non degreed or the unlearned, the ones that haven't been to seminary, they could be considered the foolish. Oh, that's foolish not to go to school. That's or, or that they're, they don't have the wisdom uh, to be able to minister to the flock of God. The non degreed are the foolish to despise the are nots when it comes down to being used significantly in the kingdom of God in any kind of a leadership capacity. They're all maybe only good for, you know, some kind of servanthood type of thing, which we are all servants. That's what ministry means is to serve. But we could never, ever have the intelligence, the, the ability to articulate the things of God to people in a way that would be meaningful and bring into salvation, deliverance, or healing. No, no, no. The non-degreed are the foolish to despise the are nots. Hallelujah. But the anointing chose the common unlearned fisherman to preach the gospel and start a revolution in this earth. The greatest revolution that has ever, it's a global revolution. There's been revolutions and civil wars and stuff and countries and stuff all since the beginning of time, pretty much. But there was never a global revolution. And the anointing chose the common unlearned fishermen to preach the gospel and start a revolution for the kingdom of God that is still underway. That is still taking place still recruiting recruiting uh, uh soldiers and ambassadors and generals and footmen and come on it's still underway so hmm, not many mighty not many noble not many wise after the flesh but the foolish the weak the base the despised things and the are not Hath the Lord chosen, hath the Lord exalted, hath the Lord authorized, hath the Lord called. Not only does every Christian have a unique calling, but each is called in a unique way. I want to share a little bit about my testimony, then we're going to wrap up. So I shared a little bit last week, one of a testimony. I just want to share for anyone that's listening and might be interested, and you may, you know, I want to just know a little bit about my journey. Um, <laughs> I encountered Christ, the resurrected Christ in 2005. And, you know, I didn't ask to be, I did not ask to be an apostle. 
to not ask for this. I just love the Lord. And I love ministering to people, ministering hope and strength and courage, just being a blessing to people. And then as we started in ministry and we planted CEK, we were, you know, pastoring and at our church in, in, in you know, in, in Tampa area, God just really just started making our identity and the oil and the call, the approach, the method, the thrust, all of those kinds of things. He started making it very evident that we are apostles and prophets. But then, you know, of course, being the woman of God that I am and loving to study the word of God, um, I was, you know, wanting to, to find, am I hearing from you correctly, God? I, I need you to validate. I need to know that this isn't just, 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 uh, an illusion, a, a, a lie, a word, a deception, you know, uh, so how can I measure and in, in in attain whether or not I'm, I'm truly called? And so one of the key, one of the key things that people will point to as far as an apostle being called, you know, um, that's if they even believe that they still um, are in operation, which that's a whole other subject, doesn't make sense to me, but it's that they must have seen Jesus face to face. And um, I was like, well, Lord, and I, that's a big argument. A lot of people say that the apostles, that that has ceased because those apostles were called and they saw Jesus face to face. But then we have the account of Apostle Paul, who did not see him face to face in the flesh, but in the spirit he did. And so, um, you know, when you see even Apostle Paul's account, you don't see that Christ, Christ just gave him the beginning steps, but Christ did not uh, tell him, oh, I'm calling you, you know, as an apostle and you're going to go here, you're going to go there. And he didn't give them all, all of the steps. He just gave him the next step, but he had a face-to-face -face encounter where he knew Christ, you know, and he believed that he, he is and was. So he just followed those steps. So I had that, you know, um, as I was, as I was seeking God, God took me back. He's like, oh, how you forget Oh, how you have forgotten the our significant encounter. And it's not so much that I forgot. It's just that I didn't connect that that was the moment because I've had several beautiful encounters. But um, I, I have my, I have my uh, journal here and I was sharing with my husband, Prophet Jerry, last night. And I was sharing with him um, things that I wrote way back. <clears throat> and my encounter happened on September 11th, 2005. And uh, we were at a, a church. I don't want to say the church's name or the pastor's name, but um, we were fellowshipping there. And this was right after I had came back out of a backslidden state. And um, I had been saved, but I had backslidden. But now I was uh, had been delivered and I was at this church for a season. My pastor had sent me there because I had a very strong deliverance ministry, which they, they did. And while I was there, my husband uh, started coming to church and he got saved uh, two Sundays before um, this Sunday. And so he... Uh, this Sunday was baptism and communion Sunday. And I was sharing with Prophet last night. I said, Prophet, I said, you know, I always just thought about this one incident being like this single, this single incident. But when I was reading my journal, I realized that there was four significant things that happened on this day. Um, but I'm only going to share with you my personal one, but I do want to give an honorable mention to Jerry's. It was baptism Sunday and he had a divine encounter with God as well. I, I, I remember this explicitly when he came up out that water, he was a changed man. He was on fire. I mean, he had to give his testimony, but he had an open, he, he had all of that with God himself as well. And I had to, I had the same 
had a similar, had a divine encounter with God on the same day. And we were just, just basking in joy last night and just reconsidering how God raised us up at the same time in the same place. It, and that had always been our pastor's prayer that we would stay yoked up and evenly yoked, evenly walking, that no one would get left behind. And so um, I, I I will tell you before I read, read uh, my short account, I was so desperate, y'all don't understand. I was so desperate, you don't understand. I was so desperate, so grateful to God because the hell that I had came out of, the backslidden state that I had came out of, I mean, it was it was the worst. It was the worst and the longest period of drug abuse, and just uh, and me and and me and Prophet were together in that in that five year stretch. We were together in that five year stretch. We were together in that degradation and abuse. And so I was, I was so grateful to God that he accepted me back and that I received his love. And I remember standing there in the aisle because the way they did communion was they had the table set up at the front and you had to, you know, come down the aisle and she would serve you as you got to the top of the aisle where she was at, where the overseer was. And I was just standing there praying in the, I was praying and praying and praying and she was ministering, whatever. I do not remember exactly what she was saying, but whatever she said, bless me. Cause I wrote it in here that the, the words that she was speaking was breaking things off. And I just got this, such a sense of desperation before I even got to the table. I was like, God, I need, I mean, I was committed. I wasn't going to change nothing. I was not going back for nothing in the world, but I wanted to experience him like never before. And I said, Lord, you know, I, 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 I need to I just, I didn't know what to ask for. I don't even know what I was asking for, but I was just desperate desperate before I took the communion, that this communion would be something like never before. And so <clears throat> my account says that um, I communed with my Lord and my Savior for the first time in my life in total spirit and truth. I have never, huh, could never imagine or conceive how it was truly supposed to be. The overseer imparted into my spirit revelation that I had not received before. God used her to speak to me. He showed me forgiveness. I never fully got it before. I wanted it, but I never got it. God met me at First Pilgrim on our family day and has not left my side since. He has been walking and talking with me since, feeding me and holding me, comforting me, healing me, delivering me, teaching me, loving me. But here, today, as I approach the communion table, and I'm in a different church for a season, as I approach the communion table, the spirit, of the Lord became a candle, huh, searching and shining light on the innermost parts of my soul, showing me me, examining me. He revealed that my biggest hindrance in my walk with God has been, and then was my late brother. Some of y'all know my, my story of, of, of molestation and stuff. My biggest hindrance in my walk with God has been him. And in a twinkling of an eye and the power of Jesus agape love, it was finished. I knew forgiveness and the gift of it. I trembled, breaking the bread, and my soul was washed 
and my soul washed itself with my tears and I ate of the flesh of my savior and it was indescribable. My hands shook so much I thought I would spill the cup. Jesus washed me whiter than snow and when I put the cup down, I was so overcome and weak in my body, yet strong in my spirit. And I could hear what seemed like angels singing and praising God. <laughs> and my spirit witnessed and praised God and shouted. And I, through my tears, blinding my natural sight, was helped away from the table and I just fell on the altar and worshiped him who is truly worthy. Supernatural isn't sufficient for what God did for me. It was so overwhelming that I feel like my heart, mind, and soul would have collapsed under the glory of my Lord if it wasn't, if it wasn't for, if it wasn't the fact that it was a move of God. In that moment, as I lay on the altar, I mean, I lay there and it was as if the Lord, he teleported me. I think about John, the revelation of John and how he was taken up into the heavens. And it was as if the Lord teleported me back to Golgotha. And I saw, I mean, I could hear the nails ringing. I could see my savior being nailed to the cross. But at the same time, though, I saw him on the cross. It was him. He was with me. I was, he was not on, he was on the cross, but it was as if he was taking me and showing me all of these wonderful things that he did just for me to the tomb, how he wasn't there anymore. He walked me, he 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 showed me his self, his resurrected. Mm. I was with the Lord. I was with the Lord. And I have other things in here that I wrote when it comes down to my purpose. And I was sharing with my husband last night, the Lord, when I asked the Lord what my purpose was, that he said that I am to be like rain that I am to be like rain. I'm not to, I'm just to be obedient like rain. When, when he releases me, I'm just to fall. I'm just to be like rain. I don't have any questions. I don't have any agenda. I'm just to be like rain. And I mean, there's just so many things that, that he wrote, that I wrote in here inspired by him. But that moment, at the at the communion table, my husband, when he came up out of the baptismal waters, and me, when I came from the communion table, we were two brand spanking new people by the time we made it back to the pews. We had been with Jesus that day. And um, it was, I finished here saying it was so great a feeling it felt like it would have killed my, it was so great a feeling like it would have killed my natural body. I guess in a way it did kill my flesh and resurrected the spirit God sent into my mother's womb over 42 years ago. I'm saved. My name is forever written in the Lamb's book of life. Thank you for your joy, dear Lord. I love you, your friend, Marguerite. Listen, not only. Every, every Christian has a unique experience, a unique calling, called in a very unique way. When that experience happened, I didn't know where I was going to end up in my walk with God. I didn't know. But he revealed himself to me. He showed me the cross. And I believe even in that moment, he gave me my litmus test for being able to find him, find his spirit, find his affirmation, his approval in the word by saying, you got to, you've, if you don't see the cross, you don't see me. You, you haven't gotten to where you are supposed to be. All things are done through and by the cross. And so even our ministry is cross over empowerment kingdom ministries because our motto is we cross over under the cross 
I'll never, ever forget that. I always have to bring people back to the cross and then to the tomb and then point them to our Lord who is seated in heavenly places. But this is the process. We've got to go through these steps. And uh, I didn't know that that would be, I didn't know what that meant. Just like I know that Apostle Paul didn't know that he was being, you know, called as an apostle. It wasn't right then and there, but he was, he had that encounter with Jesus and then Jesus sent him, sent him on his first thing. And the Lord, he said, he said, just be like rain. <laughs> and point people to the cross. Everything's got to come through the cross. Everything's got to be processed through the cross. I know the Bible, it gives us a long list of leaders who were called in a unique fashion. And though uh, some patterns are repeated, um, each call happens under its own circumstances and it and, and follows its own rules. I don't want y'all to put people in bondage or to put yourself in bondage trying to, to believe and figure out if, if, if God loves you, desires you, and has a call on your life. Everyone has a calling. And there's a unique anointing for your calling and a unique area and place of exaltation and authority in your calling. Your calling is going to follow its own rules. It's going to follow its own rules, but there should be, there should be the common factor of seeing Jesus somehow, some way somewhere you can point to a divine experience or encounter where Jesus made himself real in your life and imprinted, branded, seared your conscience with his presence, with the reality, the truth of who he is. Listen, let me wrap up here. Though some patterns are repeated, each call, happens under its own circumstances and follows its own rules. The call is, is actually a form of a word, you know, because a call, sure, a call could be vocal, it could be sounds, but usually there's something that's communicated in there. So the call, it becomes the prevailing word, the prevailing communication, the marching orders in the life of the call. I don't know about you, but God has given me a strong and encouraging word, a strong and encouraging call, which enables me to overcome any feeling and fear of rejection, failure, inadequacy, and unworthiness. This word, this call that now rules my life as law, <laughs> this is what makes me unapologetic about my exaltation and authority therein. Mm -hmm. My exaltation and authority is simply in my call. When persecution and trials come, the Lord is testing me to see how I will respond. Will I make my calling and election sure? Will, will I trust and obediently follow his word over my life and trust him with the results of my obedience? Or will I fall into the pit of someone's inability to see me the way God sees me? Will I deny the anointing of the most high to accommodate a human's visual acuity, which is spiritual blindness. Mm -hmm. And then thereby reap the consequences of my disloyalty to his strong word on my life. For what? To obey their unbelief? God forbid. I've come to believe that the fear of rejection 
that, th that it is actually a direct result of a lack of credibility. <laughs> whether, whether it's, whether the lack of credibility be true or whether it be perceived by, by either yourself or by others, because sometimes we lack credibility because we are credible. There is no credibility. But sometimes it's because we perceive ourselves as not having the credibility, but we don't understand what makes us credible. So therefore we discredit ourselves or others. Other people don't perceive us as credible, as qualified, as able to be exalted and authorized, anointed and appointed, used and called by God in the area that we are operating in. Credible. Mm -hmm. I believe the fear of rejection comes when we, as a direct result of a lack of credibility. Because when you're credible, you don't care. You don't worry about it. You just figure, well, I'm not called to you, or you're not my, you're not my client. You're not my customer. If, if, if you don't have a need for my services, if you don't have a need for my product, you know, that doesn't make me not credible because you don't have a need because you don't, you, no, it just, you, I'm just not called to you. Credible. What does credible mean? Credible is offering reasonable grounds for being believed or trusted. Good enough to be effective. <laughs> Credible evidence is evidence that's likely to be believed. A credible plan is one that might actually work. And a credible excuse is, is one your parents might actually believe. Credible, credible. And just as credible means believable, the word credibility means believability or the quality or power of inspiring belief. Beloved, it is the divine call of God that makes one's credibility true and not artificial, not fraudulent, and not an illusion. It is the divine call of God, hallelujah, that produces the fruit that the called bear. I can't produce, I can't bear no fruit without a divine call, without the anointing. The anointing is the seed. It brings the sperma of God that can bear fruit. It is the, the divine call which makes one's credibility true. That produces the fruit that the call bear. That is the evidence that substantiates our credibility or believability. And God only exalts the called. He only exalts the called. Psalm 75 verses four through seven and verse 10 says, I said to the boastful, do not deal boastfully. And to the wicked, do not lift up the horn. Do not lift up your horn on high. Do not speak with a stiff neck. For exaltation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But, the, but God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. All the horns of the wicked will also cut off, be cut off. But the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. The horns are the strength and the dominion. The Lord is saying all the, the strength and the dominion of the wicked will be cut off. But the horns, the strength and the dominion of the righteous shall be exalted. 
God exalts the call and, and you must, you cannot be called and not righteous because there's some people that are called, but they aren't living a righteous life. They are not submitted to the call of God. Call God calls us to righteousness, to holiness. And it is the righteous that shall be exalted. And Psalm 148, 14 says, and he has exalted the horn, the, the strength and the dominion of his people, the praise of all his saints. So as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, I humbly and gratefully take my seat, my exalted seat of authority in heavenly places in Christ. And I make my boast in him alone. I don't care whether someone believes I'm allowed to sit in the, in the front of the bus at the head of the boardroom table or whether I'm called to lead from an exalted and authoritative place in the kingdom of God as an apostle. I believe and I know that I'm called to take my seat and thereby produce fruit through the branches that are united to me. Others' acceptance or rejection of me doesn't move me farther from or closer to the call or make me apologize for anyone's discomfort or unbelief because of my call. What moves me closer onward and upward is God's word and spirit in and over my life. And as a result of the presence and anointing of God, I am the ministry of God. I am a movement of God. And I don't rely on anyone else's revelation, anyone else's faith anyone else's agreement to validate and empower this truth and his anointing in my life. It is what it is. What it, is. I, it just is what it is. Unapologetically, it is what it is. The anointing does not apologize for being who and what he is. He doesn't apologize for being who and what he is in the lives of those God calls his mighty ones. The anointing just does what the Lord sends him to do. Anoint, help, empower, exalt, and authorize those who God calls his mighty ones, the least of them, the are nots. The, the, the despised ones, the ones who are the, the contempt, the ones who are uh, contemptible to others who don't believe that we can be used by God and called by God and exalted and authorized by God. So in conclusion, I, I just want to say that I believe that all leaders should come to this resolve that I just stated about myself. Huh. We should come to this resolve that we need, above all, the approval and the anointing of God, not the approval and the acceptance of man, but the approval and the anointing of God. God wants to exalt us and increase our authority for maximum impact. That's the reason for maximum impact in our assignment to prepare the earth for the return of Christ as king. We need to be empowered by the hand of God and show fruit of this by serving and leading in a way far superior than what we could lead in our own ability, far superior to what we could achieve in our own ability. God desires for us to be like a tree planted by his rivers of water. 
bringing forth much fruit in our season, a tree whose leaf never withers, prospering in all our works for him. His desire is for us to be unapologetically and fruitfully exalted in and with him. Amen. Amen. So that um, concludes our second installment in our Much Fruit series. And I pray that there's something I said, something that the Holy Spirit put in my heart to share, that it has encouraged you. It has encouraged you to see yourself the way God sees you and to allow him. Hallelujah. Woo! To make you one of his righteous ones through your submission to his will and authority in your life so that he can exalt you and authorize you to make maximum impact. Hallelujah. There's people that need us, need us to show up unapologetically. Mm -hmm. Amen. So if anyone, if there was anything that you heard that resonated with you personally, that maybe God put his finger on and is challenging you with that you may want to share, um, you know, then then that then you may go ahead and do that now. And then um we will get ready to close out and get ready for we've got a 6 p.m. installment of word infusion of the word coming from evangelist Sean and evangelist Debrea. And we have an 8 p.m. infusion of word coming from uh, Wisdom Ministries. So God, he is he is making us unapologetic. He, his goal for us is to, is to bear much fruit, okay? And, um, and I'm just so grateful to, to this opportunity that he's given me to what he's laid on my heart. And some people might be like, well, I'm just trying to really figure out what's this got to do with fruit? Oh, all of this. Because because bottom line is we're just looking at how the anointing, the results of the anointing mm -hmm, and the fruit that is born from the anointing. And we need to know these things so we can receive them and be comfortable. Be comfortable. Being exalted and authorized in God. <laughs> Glory be seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Ooh, we got to get used to this elevated view, y'all. We got to see, I don't like heights. I, you know, I don't like heights. I'm, you know, I'm good. Just keep me, you know, first, second floor. I don't like heights. But when it comes down to the kingdom, I got to, I got to, I got to get over my fear of heights. <laughs> Amen. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Anyone want to share anything? We're going to wrap yes. up. Be Vance, the song, woman of God. <laughs> oh, this was so, uh, I love, I just love to hear your testimony. I just love to hear different aspects of it and I know I haven't heard all of it and you know maybe I won't but I, the one the parts that I hear I need it you know we need it you know for that moment and it's just so uh so very awesome but I, I just want to all the whole message just really bless me it just um like I like I say sometimes some some things you know, can be taught, but some things have to be caught. And for me, this is a message that has to be caught. Um, and it is teaching me, but when I say caught, I mean like my spirit capture it, you know, embrace it. Um, because a lot, sometimes we can hear teaching and that's good. And, you know, sometimes it just sits kind of on the surface perhaps. Um, but this word, this message, this series, fruit, much fruit, um, it is I'm I'm capturing it, you know, I'm mm -hmm. holding on to it and letting it sink and settle down in my spirit so that I can walk in that elevated and be unapologetic. So anyway, so I thank you, you know. Um, 
so the the one of the thing the, the last the, like toward the la- end when you said that when you talked about the spirit of rejection, on my ears went oh because I know that's something that I um I used to <laughs> struggle with, right? Um, but now I'm coming into a you know just getting my deliverance, being delivered, being delivered, right? You said the spirit of uh, rejection comes from the lack of credibility. You know, mm-hmm. it's what you see in yourself. Like you got, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm coming into that, you know, and it just touched my spirit. That's what I'm saying. It, I, it caught me because that's where I'm at. I'm learning. I'm standing up. You know what I mean? Like in who Sean is, you know, like I'm, I, I, you know, I've been myself, of course, but my call, you, hey, no, 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 that part, that part, but my call, like the essence of who I am, like God is, you know, I'm standing up and unapologetic, like I'm just who I am. Maybe I'm not called to you. And so, if you reach it, then I wasn't supposed to be you know what I mean? I'm not for you and I'm not for everybody. And that's the part that I've always, you know, all my life, I want to just love everybody. Don't want nobody mad at me. Just, you know, but lately, having people mad with me, I'm just, they just like spit the bad, just like, oh, okay. You know what I mean? But I believe that God has been teaching me how to let go and just be who you are in spite of what other people do. That's on them. Let them deal with that. You continue to stand in who you are, your authority, the power I'm giving you, period. You know, and that really, and I, and, and I've discredited myself based on the opinions of others, you know, or what they have to say, or, you know, and sometimes even family, because we want our family to just be, they're like, oh, my God, they're like, man. <laughs> you're like, wait a minute, was I really called? You know what I'm saying? But yeah, I can, yeah, I've been called by God, you know, I've been called by guys, by God, guys, and if they say, eh, oh, well, that's not, uh, you know, going to sway me in any way. I'm learning that. I'm, I, I can, this message, it just put a little bit more, you know, like, I don't know. I can't describe, but you know how you're standing, but then you stand like, mm-hmm. you know, a little bit uh, straighter, you know, mm-hmm. in my, in my, and in, in like my resolve in who I am. And I'm excited and to be honest, and I'd say this, and I'm going to get to you say, it was when I submitted, wisdom was already under CK, but when Sean, mm-hmm. Shawnee Pooh, me, <laughs> came under, I I've seen the difference. I've seen mm-hmm. You know, my, you know, whole character and being, it's a settledness. Yes. Like I'm really like settling, not all the mm-hmm. way, you know, knowing the full, but no, I don't need to know all that. I just need to know what step we're on right now, Lord, you know, <laughs> where we at right now. Okay. Let me, let me, mm-hmm. let me master this step and then we'll move on to whatever, you know, and I'm, even that is changing. Cause I'm, I gotta know everything. I, every, you know, but God is like, you have to, why, why you have to? I know it as long as I don't know it, you're good, you know, and that's kind of where I am. So thank you, Apostle. That last part just my my call makes my credibility true. It's the divine call. That's where our credibility comes from. That's it. I yeah. mean, yeah. Yes. <laughs> you know, I'm just excited about it. So I thank God, thank God for you and Prophet. You all just plowing and continuing you know y'all have been anointed to continue and so are we you know 
And that in spite of whatever, you know, is happening, whatever, it, it doesn't, it's not going to shake us. No, like Mm-mm. Dr. Johnson said, we're unshakable, unmovable, always yes. abounding, abound, mm-hmm. abounding, higher, right? Yes, Elevation yes. Going up in the Lord mm-hmm. because I, what our labor is not in vain. So. You bless me. I'm so grateful that you, you know, that you shared that. I think you shared that before, but it, it's just affirmation that we are, th- this is what makes our call credible. This is what, this gives credibility to us as a ministry of the divine call. And because God, so I'm just very passionate about nurturing leaders in all of the different areas that they need so that they can be because God needs, there's a leadership crisis in the world across the board in all genres. And so I'm called to kingdom, not entrepreneurial leaders, even though if you're a kingdom citizen and you're entrepreneurial, you're a leader, I'm called, you know, I can, I can, you know, be called to you. But bottom line is the fact that you're saying that you see this difference, this just confirms that the oil and who we are in the call that it is effective. We're making an impact because we're called to speak to the leader in you, not specifically to the mom, though what we bring can help you as a mom, so on and so forth. But my target is to, to mine, to excavate, to raise up, to exalt and authorize <laughs> through the power of the anointing, the leader in you the call of God on your life. To me, that's the leader because not everybody's called to be fivefold, but whatever that thing is, your purpose, that's what you are to lead out in your life from. You, your life is led, should be led by the call on it, by the purpose for which you were even sent to this earth. And so it's not just fivefold ministry leaders. I want people to understand that, but it's anyone who is a believer in his kingdom and wants to be activated and strengthened in their purpose. That is the leader in you, your purpose from God, who he says you are, your name that is known and spoken to you in the spirit by God. Because your name that you have here on the earth is not your name. It's the, it's your name in the earth realm, but it is not your true name. The shepherd has customized and individual names for all the sheep. And he calls you according to your purpose. He calls you according to your identity in his eyesight. And a shepherd, when he names the sheep, that the name of the sheep points a lot to the history with the sheep, um, the sheep's origin, the sheep's purpose. There's some unique, there's something unique in that name that is shared between the, the maker, the owner of the sheep and the sheep itself. The sheep has nothing to do with their name. The shepherd calls them according to his history and his relationship with them. So I want y'all to be encouraged by that understanding, by that revelation. It might be revelation for some people that you have a name that you are called by in the spirit that you have no clue of. And it's, it's a spiritual name. And, uh, and that's your leader. That is your leader. That is who you really are. And that's how you should be showing up in life. And that's what we desire here to do at CEK is to minister to that leader and it's going to be, most of the time, it's going to be by, I'm not going to say by accident, because, you know, I don't accidentally do things. I do things as led of the Lord, but it may not be where I, like, I know it and I'm going to purposely, no, no, no. I'm just doing what God calls me to do in preferably, preferably it will do like Evangelist Sean said, it will make the difference in ways that only she knows and brings her to a place of, of becoming in God that she hadn't become before, so Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Anyone else want to share anything before we close out? Evangelist to Gray, a woman of God. Very quickly, as always, Apostle, um, excellent teaching and sharing is, is, is beautiful. And when you were sharing about the rise in the region, the quality and great importance, and also then at the end, you was talking about 
the height. And the Lord had been dealing with me. It was like, you're already elevated. He says, I'm mm -hmm. taking you to new dimensions. And he's, it was like an eagle. The eagle is always sowing. They're going higher and higher. They're, you don't see them in the ground. He says, you cannot do it. about You can't see if you stay at the, sub, the same level. You have to come up higher so you can get a, a viewpoint from where I'm seeing it and you can see at the same level. The much fruit is so necessary. This was so awesome because it was, I was kind of going through something and it was like, you know, like Sean was saying, you know, I, I guess I love people and everybody's happy and, you know, cool and, you know, it's a beautiful world out here. Come on, even, even it may not look that way. And we're, um, but when you know that you know that you know that God is, see, has already called you, have placed you, then it was like God is standing up in me. I mean, you know, it's like he was, you know, I was sitting and I guess I had him sitting, not that he wanted to sit, but, you know, it's like I took the lid off and I have that confidence in mm -hmm. him, not arrogant, not cocky, humble before him, but knowing mm -hmm. that Christ in my life is the center. That's right. And what he what you sharing over, you know, and I'm in every class basically that you bring forth. So this is all tying in, you know, from from you know from whew, from faith essential and all the other classes. This is just like, huh, okay, now I'm gonna make a complete picture and you just take all of this in and you absorb it. You know, he, he said that we are accountable for what we know. Okay, mm -hmm. not what you heard is what you know. And once you, he knows that you know, then there's mm -hmm. no more excuses. And that's what he's been doing with me. He says, I have called you. I have anointed you. I have placed you where I want you to be. And you, like you say, you go to the leaders. You, you're pulling the leadership out of mm -hmm. each and every one of us because God had already placed this in us and where he wants it to come forth. This is so, so important. And it was like, most of all, you know, the message was like, it's like, it's like she was saying, it's caught in the spirit. The spirit man is like, you know, it's like this, it's just soaking it up. It's like, oh yeah, mm, this is so good. And there is no lack of credi credibility when you take what we are learning and apply it and appropriate it and hold on to that and let God work through you with it. Thank mm. you, Apostle. God bless. Amen. Amen. God bless you too, woman of God. Grateful. And I'm just grateful. Thank you. I'm glad it was on time to help you. Dr. Johnson. Praise God. Oh my God, this was so powerful. Um, all I kept hearing in my spirit is empowered mm. empowered and i i feel like it's another level of of empowerment just in my identity and uh, me even receiving even the the prophetic words and really embracing like when i when i hear them when i receive them truly truly it's not that i'm not believing them but embracing them that god actually selected me to walk in this calling in in this truth mm -hmm. and that it is okay to to be to to know that that you are elevated and that that you are exalted by God to to know and to to receive that truth fully and completely and um unapologetically walk in that authority because that that is that has to do with that one kingdom order as well as being unshakable in our identity and i love when you talked about the per 
the perception of other people. And that that part that you were you, I'm gonna have to just go back and listen to just that particular aspect because it was so profound, you know, in 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 how you articulated it, because who we are and what we have been called to is not predicated or validated. Uh, based on anybody else's ability or inability to to see and perceive it is it is not it's not based on that at all at all it is it is only solely in God and what he has deemed and what he has said is true about us so that right there that was so very liberating for me it was so very liberating because not that i was dependent on it but it just gave me another level of freedom to operate in all of who god has called me to be in Godfidence and having confidence in the God in me, not in uh, any type of arrogance or pride or false humility, but being sure in in short up in the God in me and the anointing and the call that's on my life. It has it has truly strengthened me. This this um, message today has strengthened me as well. And so thank you, thank you, thank you, Apostle, for your labor of love and for allowing the Lord to use you and bring us to higher heights and deeper depths in him. Blessings. Glory to God, amen. To God be the glory. It's, it's definitely my will to do the Lord's will and and he's, he's, um, it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, really, Lord, you want me to share my personal stuff? But it is what it is. It is what it is. It's all part of the process for us all. And so we have to, you know, we overcome by the word of the Lord and, and by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So, mm -hmm. my God, hallelujah. You know, I believe it's just an exercise and, and the Lord wants to, you know, minister to us in, in, in many different levels and even uh, make a case. You know, sometimes we read the scriptures, you read the letters that Paul wrote, you know, different uh, leaders may have wrote in passages where they make a case for, for Christ in their life, for their leadership, for their call. And that's something that I don't really, you know, uh, concern myself with. But at the same time, God is like, he, he challenged me, you know, so it's like, okay. And, I, and he's going to continue to challenge me in each message and, and much fruit. Um, I already see the, 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 the pattern now. Let's see what he wants to do. He's going to challenge me to throw myself out there and to, and to share my own testimonies and encounters and things with him. So it is what it is. Who glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, um, I don't know, Elder Joanne, um, if you want to share anything or Sister Regis or anyone else. Um want to hear from you if you want to share anything uh, before we close out. And I would like to ask Evangelist Sean to close us out in prayer today. Hallelujah. I want to announce that next week, Mother's Day, we are going to have our, a special guest, uh, minister. Of, I'm so excited about that. Uh, Apostle Ada Davis. We just love her, me and Prophet. And, and some of you, uh, Dr. Johnson, I think, I'm not sure if you went to the service with us. I know um, Evangelist Leslie went and I think Evangelist Valerie, when we fellowshiped with them a couple of times in Tampa, but uh, Apostle Ada will be with us next Sunday as our guest speaker for, for Mother's Day. And I'm just so 
They're looking forward to the the um, oil. Yes, 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 yes. I know you were there. I just didn't know. If, I don't think Regis was there. I'm not sure if Regis was there or not. So I'm excited about that. And I hope y'all are excited too. Um, to have Apostle Ada Davis with us next Sunday. So if if there's no other um, comments or anything, I'm going to go ahead and give it on over to Evangelist Sean to close us out in prayer. Thank you, Jesus. God. Thank you, Father God. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Father. We give you the highest praise. Mm -hmm. We give you the highest praise, Lord, because you, hallelujah, are exalted. And because you are exalted, God, you exalt us in our callings, God, in our elections and making sure that we make our calling and election sure. Father, we thank you for this word, God, that was just declared over us today. Father, we thank you for the vessel Hallelujah, the vessel of honor. Hallelujah, in the voice of Apostle Marguerite. God, we thank you, God, that she is a vessel of honor fit for your use, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, bless your holy name, God. We give you the glory. Father, we thank you, God, for this time of ministry, God. And, I, and we pray and we come into agreement, God, that you will replenish her. <laughs> yes, God. And I'm all shot. Yes, God, replenish her, Lord. God, just pour back into her virtue, pour back into her power, pour back into her strength. Lord God, everything that she's poured out this morning, this afternoon, God, that you would pour it back into her, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I thank you for the peace of God that she's walking in, the power that she's walking in, your, your presence. Lord God, thank you for the presence, Lord God, that you are demonstrating through her, your presence. Father, we thank you, Lord. We pray, Father God, that we will not be hearers only. Woo, my shota. Yes, God, that we will not be only hearers, but that we will be doers of the word, that we will take this word and we will do it, that we will take this word and walk in our calling, walk in our authority, God. God, show us and guide us and lead us. Holy Spirit, you said you would lead us and guide us into all truth. So thank you, God, the truth that you have for us, for what you have called us to do as leaders, Father. We thank you for this ministry. We thank you for the people, everyone that's represented, Lord God. We decree, decree and declare blessings. God, I thank you for the hedge. I thank you for the hedge of protection. We thank you for Psalms 91 protection, that no evil will befall CEK family and its affiliates. Hallelujah. Lord God, no uh, evil will befall us, nor will any plague come near our dwelling. For God, you have given your angels charge over CEK family and its affiliates. Lord God, a uh, charge over us to keep us. Hey. Keep us in all our ways, Father. We thank you that this is the week of increase, that this is the week of overflow, that this is the week of restoration. I pray that your manifested blessings, Lord God, manifested blessings will be visible to us this week, God, that you would show up supernaturally, Lord God, and that we will continue to testify of your goodness. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you. We praise you. We say the Lord bless and keep us. Lord, make your face shine on us. Be gracious to us, God. Lift up your countenance on us. Bless us with peace. Shalom. Nothing broken, nothing missing, and nothing lacking. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Glory to God. Glory. And thank you so much, evangelist. God bless you all. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon, and I'll see you at 8 p.m. on Wisdom. God bless you.